thanks paul for the kind introduction and uh, i would like to thank uh, hevo for providing me this opportunity and uh, also supporting my visit here i'm a postdoctoral fellow at max planck uh, institute for solar system research and i mostly work with uh, hardy peter and sami solanki so i wanted to discuss with you my recent work on uh, shocks jets and bursts and associate these dynamic phenomena to the coronal loops as you all know coronal loops are giant plasma arcades that are hot and sus suspended by the magnetic field in the solar atmosphere but over the past two weeks we have some new results that i would like to share with you so skip talking about shocks and continue so the scope of the talk is fairly straightforward i would like to establish as i go along the connection that between the coronal loops that we see here to their photospheric foot points why establishing such a connection would eventually give us better understanding of mass and energy transfer into the solar corona but this connection is not straight forward because we know that in the photosphere the magnetic field is highly fragmented to demonstrate this i show here on the left a line of sight full disk magnetic field map obtained from sdohmi that shows a scattered patches of white and black regions so these are the positive and negative polarities of the magnetic field as seen in the line of sight if i zoom into a 30 megameter by 30 megameter size in the disk center we continue to observe these patchy magnetic fields even at the scales of about 70 kilometers so this means that association of coronal structures to the photospheric magnetic field is fairly complicated even more so these magnetic fields don't stay still they are continually buffeted by the granular motion so here i show in this beautiful color a intensity map of a uh, solar photosphere that shows several visible structures obvious structures are the granulation the small hexagonal patterns that are everywhere and then in the large scale we see some magnetic fields that are sunspots and smaller pores and not clearly visible in this color scale everywhere scattered are the kilogauss magnetic elements so the evolution of the granules continually foot moves these foot points and the energy generated by such a motion is eventually transported into the atmosphere and is heated in the solar corona such an idea was already proposed by parker in uh, 90s uh, sorry 70s and 90, uh, 80s where he argued that if we have a magnetic field tied between two photospheric plates and we randomly move these photospheric plates the magnetic field eventually gets tangled and then a braiding structure will develop once the braiding structure is developed you have current sheets and these current sheets start dissipating leading to the heating of solar corona this profound idea of parker has been central to many of the advanced coronal loop models for example here on the left i show a alfen wave turbulence model that employs some random foot point motions at the photosphere and alfen waves are generated in the corona and dissipated in a stochastic way on the right is another model where the foot point motions generate braiding in the corona leading to the current sheet formation and plasma heating so it is clear that these foot point motions play an important role in most of the coronal heating theories at least for the case of quite sun there are some signatures of these alfen waves detect detected so here i show a movie of a uh, uh, enhanced movie of calcium from hinode sot showing these strand like structures called spicules these are shot up at a very high speed and at larger heights they seem to show some swaying motion interpreted as alfen waves even if we look into the coronal heights this swaying motions continue to exist and then they seem to have phase speeds and the amplitudes necessary to explain most of the quiet solar coronal heating and also the fast solar wind driving but what about the active region corona but as you can see this movie shows that the active region corona is highly dynamic and then it's usually a mess to observe Uh, individual events and then try to associate what is happening the first thing we notice is that the core of active region shows rapid brightenings of loops that reach up to several million kelvin at once 
and these brightenings often are seen at the same location. So we need a heating process that is almost as if it's switched on and that generates also very high amounts of heating rates. Then traditional questions naturally come. What is, it, what is the heating um, mechanism? Is it magnetic field line braiding or MHD waves? And where is the location of the heating? And what is the frequency of the heating? These are natural questions come that arise once we look into observations like this. So with this background, I would like to start my obsession basically with the coronal loops and then try to understand what is happening at the foot points. So I will uh, now show a series of examples, uh, mostly obtained using the Sunrise, SDO, and IRIS observatories. For those of you who don't know, Sunrise is a balloon-born observatory with a one meter telescope that completed two observing cycles, one in 2009 and one in 2013. And in 2013, it observed an active region. So Sunrise has two instruments on board, IMAX that records the magnetic field and SUFI, a chromospheric imager. So here is a field of view obtained by the Sunrise IMAX. It nicely covered uh, emerging active region and Sufi's field of view is outlined by this white box. So both these covered some regions of the foot points of the current loops that is seen here. And uh, we would like to know what is happening in this at the foot points of these coronal loops because apparently the foot point motions are the are very important in driving the heating into the solar corona. Now I will just take a look into the magnetic field map obtained by the IMAX. You can already notice that because of its extremely high resolution, 10 times better than the SDO HMI, it shows structures that are much at much smaller scales that are clearly not visible in the SDO maps. So here I highlight uh, four regions that are the foot points of some of the loops that we observed in uh, SDO AIA. And we will examine in much more detail uh, this loop that is outlined in these boxes C and D. And we go closer into the loop and how it is connected with the photosphere. This is the magnetic field map that is obtained by the IMAX. This is showing the photosphere granulation. And now compare it with the magnetic field map that SDO HMI observed. You can see there is a quite a bit of difference in terms of the features that, is, that are seen by this high resolution major. And this is the coronal loop that is outlined in the previous image as well. What we observed instantly was that the magnetic field at the foot point is highly dynamic and then there are also the locations where you have opposite polarity magnetic field that seem to cancel with the main polarity magnetic field here that is also one of the foot points of the coronal loop. As the magnetic field cancels, it produces some dynamic signatures that are probably small scale jets or even spicules that are aligned to the overlying coronal loop. This is interesting because you have some disturbance in the photosphere that can be clearly traced through the solar chromosphere and finally into the solar atmosphere, into the corona. We compute how the magnetic field is varying here. We show for positive and negative polarities differently. Since here the negative polarity is the dominant one, it has a more or less constant field strength, but then the positive polarity field continuously decreases at a rate of 10 to the 15 Maxwells per second. This is likely a case where the flux is cancelling with the major polarity, causing some sort of magnetic reconnection and finally, <coughs> sorry, finally leading to some observable signatures of jets that are aligned with the overlying coronal loop. But then can we observe this magnetic reconnection in a different way? That is my next part where I talk about the spectropolarimetric or spectroscopic signatures of the magnetic reconnection at the lower heights that eventually disturb the coronal loops. So here is a outline of a, a, a well-developed active region showing coronal loops. And here I, I zoom into this particular region here. 
and the foot points are marked here. So these are everyday coronal loops that we see and the evolution of the foot points show to be quite normal. But there is an underlying UV burst that is clearly not visible in these uh, coronal emissions. So what is the role of this UV burst in the loop foot points? Is, is there any role? If I plot the light curves coming from the foot point here, they show certain intensity variations. But why are these intensity variations caused in the first place? That, will, that can be understood once I also show the light curves of the UV burst that is underlying but not visible in the uh, coronal emission. It seems as if the energy released in this UV burst triggers some sort of response in the coronal loops. And though the UV burst seem to be much farther, it is only a projected distance because the coronal loops can be at a different height than the UV burst. And then the response from this UV burst is triggering, uh, the energy release in the UV burst is triggering a response also in the coronal loops here. So I will try to now show the magnetic topology uh, connected to this UV burst. So here is the underlying magnetic field of that, where the UV burst has taken place. And the white box here now shows the transition region emission uh, silicon 1400 slit joint images of iris. And this bright region here is the location of the UV burst. And this is the zoom of the magnetic field map in this yellow box here. You will see that the UV burst closely follows the underlying magnetic field. And as the magnetic field element that is, that is translating from north to south, it also translates or it also triggers some response in the atmosphere where the UV burst continuously moves from north to south. If we do some magnetic field extrapolations to see what is happening or what triggered this particular UV burst. Here I show uh, some field lines traced using a magnetofictional model. And if I zoom close to that region where the UV burst happening, I see some close field lines. These are probably the fan surface of the overall topology. Then I look at the three-dimensional structure of these field lines. I find that these fan topology field lines that are closed have an overlying null point at a height of about 500 kilometers with surrounding spine field lines. And we know that this foot point is moving from north to south in this, in this fashion. This would have probably triggered a shear at the null point that eventually led to the UV burst that we see in the transition region. So to understand what kind of response the atmosphere is getting through this magnetic reconnection, we can understand, uh, we can study the spectral evolution. So here I show uh, the chromospheric spectra, and here I show the transition region spectrum that directly come from the UV burst outlined here in this uh, inset. As you can see, the UV burst shows a variety of wide profiles with Doppler shifts of uh, plus or minus 200 kilometers per second, both in the uh, chromosphere and in the transition region. Since we have also the spatial information of this UV burst and also the spectral information, we can look into the details of this uh, UV burst in more detail. So here I show uh, the same UV burst and the Doppler shifts here. The first thing to note is that there is, there are these zones of up or the blue shifts and the red shifts, which can be interpreted as zones of up and down flows. And if I draw a line here and then examine the individual spectra, what I see here is that from the north to south, the spectra nicely moves from the blue shifts to the red shifts with a transition at some mid plane here where the velocities are zero. So this can be understood uh, in a scenario where the energy is released and the jets are, are directed on the either side, which are probably the signatures of the magnetic reconnection. So to outline 
this particular UV burst and the magnetic reconnaissance signature, I show a, a collage of all the results in one place, starting from the magnetic field in the photosphere. If we zoom in, we know that there is some fan surface at lower heights and the 3D structure of the magnetic field shows that there is a null point at some height in the atmosphere and the translation motions of this parasitic polarity underlying this fan surface probably cause some UV burst at some height which also shows signatures of jets at a significant speeds comparable to sound speeds and these jets probably triggered a response in the coronal loops that we see. So this is the complete picture. Yes. Yes, but then the null point, the reconnection there has heated the plasma sufficiently such that these lines already form there. The transition region lines already form uh, at those heights because you have increased the plasma temperature significantly. So uh, I would like to recap till now what I told. So we know that, or at least the observations show that there is signature of mixed polarity magnetic field at the foot points of coronal loop that can have some dynamic signatures like jets that are aligned with coronal loop. And on the other hand, we already know some direct signatures of magnetic reconnection happening at the foot points of coronal loop. So till now I talked about the complexity of magnetic structure at the foot points of the coronal loops. But then I have not really talked about how we really form the coronal loops in the first place. And this is the next section I would like to discuss. So uh, let me explain this uh, figure a little bit. So here I show a line of sight magnetic field map and here is a AIA-94 Armstrong channel that is sensitive to plasmas of 1 and 7 million Kelvin because of its path uh, or response function. And the outline black box here is zoomed in with inset here and the contours outline magnetic field regions with uh, about 100 Gauss. And here in the background, I show a space-time map that is obtained by averaging the magnetic field across this slit and then plotting it along the slit as a function of time, just to show how the magnetic field is evolving there. As I start the movie, you will see that there will be a flux emergence of a tiny magnetic element starting from here, and it is attracted to granular motion, and finally, cancels with this positive polarity magnetic field I mentioned. That is also depicted here. So we have appearance of negative polarity magnetic element that moves towards the positive polarity magnetic element and cancels. As it cancels, it triggers a response in the 94 Armstrong channel. And the light curve plotted here is an average emission coming from this blue box in this uh, map. So you can see that a small scale magnetic polarity element has appeared and then it cancels and triggers the formation of the loop. I will play this movie one more time. So till the magnetic element really cancels with the existing polarity, there is no signature of the loop whatsoever. Only after the flux cancellation really starts, you seem to suddenly trigger the formation of the coronal loop. So here are the events depicted in three time steps. At some point, we have the appearance of this, sorry that uh, these not really visible here, but then at some point we have an appearance of a magnetic element that is giving rise to uh, this feature here, and then that reconnects or cancels with the pre-existing positive polarity element that creates an energy release at the site of reconnection. And as soon as the energy is released, the energy is deposited 
on either ends of the loop that are clearly visible as small bright dots and once the flux completely cancels the energy is deposited and then we, we see the evaporation and then the complete loop fills up with the hot plasma and now I play the movie again Yeah. Okay. Um, so to see how hot the plasma really uh, was at that time, I also overlay a ghost light curve, which is sensitive uh, to soft X-rays, and then it shows plasmas of the order of nine million to ten million Kelvin. So in this particular event, such a small scale flux cancellation really triggered the formation of a considerably large hot coronal loop that lasted about uh, 20 minutes or so. So this is what I described. We have a site of energy release and the energy release is at the location where you have the flux cancellation and once it's sufficiently cancelled the energy is deposited at the ends of the loops and these loops uh, and there will be an evaporation from the ends of these loops and that completely fills the loop as a, a bright loop. So this is another event that I described which shows basically the same picture. The energy is released in this location where we have a mixed polarity magnetic field so there is a small scale flux emergence and cancellation at that location which triggered the formation of this bright structure here. As soon as this bright structure is ejected, we already see that there is a deposition of energy at the other end of the loop and this deposition of the energy triggered the plasma evaporation also on the other end of the loop and eventually plasma evaporation from the other end and plasma injection from the, the previous end fill the loop with a uh, hot plasma. Now this is another event that describes uh, this importance of flux cancellation in the photosphere in formation of the coronal loops. So on the top here I show uh, uh, AIA 94 angstrom channel and then the blue and magenta light curves are coming from one at the this location the blue curve and then the magenta, lo uh, magenta light curve is coming from this location. If we observe the cooler 171 angstrom channel we can identify that this magenta box is the active region MOS and then the blue box is where we see some bright, bright point and apparently that bright point coincides with a flux cancellation site in the photosphere there are a couple of things to notice. So in the hotter channels once the loop forms there seem to be a simultaneous response from both ends of the foot points as you can see here. But for the cooler channels in the cooler channel there is a clear difference between the two foot points. At the foot point where the energy is released we see much more impulsive nature and at the foot point where we see the energy deposited we see much more steady emission but then the steady emission is disturbed by this event of energy deposition and only then it shows a small variability. In the past there are several studies that look at this MOS because MOS is a foot point of hot loops they would like to understand what is causing the MOS emission and the first thing they look at the MOS, they find that the MOS is fairly stable and then there is not much of intensity variability in the MOS. This they interpret as the signature of a steady state heating. But if we really look at the other side where the energy is released, this steady state heating is not there anymore and it's fairly impulsive at time scales of 5 to 10 minutes of each burst. And again the flux is cancelling at the rate of 10 to the 15 maxwells per second at this location of uh, where we see the energy release in the corona. So this is the movie of that same event. So we start seeing some disturbances here because of this flux cancellation and 
the disturbances eventually trigger the formation of this entire loop that create these huge signatures in the hotter channels but much smaller signatures in the cooler channels so this basically outlines the importance of magnetic field and its flux cancellation already in the photosphere as a role or as an agent of uh, coronal heating so what is uh, the, uh, the summary at this level is that for all the distinguishable loops that we observe in active region course we can identify localized heating sources that are associated really with the flux cancellation and this flux cancellation can occur anywhere along the axis of the loop and then once the energy is released at the flux cancellation site it is transported to the other end of the loop giving rise to some observable signatures as the bright dots that we saw and sometimes these bright dots on both ends of the loops are almost simultaneous so when i say simultaneous they are within the aia cadence of about 12 seconds so it can be much faster than 12 seconds or about 12 seconds so naturally the question comes what transports this energy so rapidly so it could be transported through a thermal conduction or non thermal particles in fact for this particular active region uh, it follow testa at all uh, looked at this region here and inferred that we need to have some non thermal particle acceleration in the corona to basically trigger the formation of the mass emission here but then what we see here is that the energy release is already coming not in the corona but through flux cancellation in the photosphere so though their conclusions may not be incorrect about the particle acceleration certainly the energy release through the braiding process that heating the moss seem to be uh, revisited at least so as i described this energy transport is also an important aspect that we would like to understand so we are uh, experimenting with some 1d loop models with a very strong heating on one foot point so here is a stable solution of a loop that is at the transition region temperature with these densities and pressures and almost no flows and here are counts that are shown for aia 171 which which is sensitive to the cooler temperatures and aia 94 angstrom which is sensitive to the hotter temperatures so these movies show that as soon as the energy is released at one foot point within one second the energy is transported to the other foot point though the loop length is about 30 me uh, megameter so it takes it travels at a speed of almost 1/10th of speed of light and then deposits the energy on the other foot point and then gives rise to the observable signature as bright dot that we see and then plasma flows that are generated because of this energy release are comparable to the local sound speed at temperatures of about 7 million kelvin the local sound speeds are about 500 kilometers per second so we observe that the similar plasma flows and once the heating is switched off the plasma completely cools down and then the plasma is draining here as these down flow signatures so i'll play the movie again at this stage after 1 second the signature has already passed to the other end and now it is in the heating phase we start seeing the density to increase and then the counts in the aia 94 dominate that of aia 171 and then the loop stays stable there for a very long time till we switch off the heating so the heating is switched off at 5 minutes so after 5 minutes we switch off heating and the plasma or the loop cools down very rapidly through draining here and then the 94 channel uh, is diminished compared compared to the 171 angstrom channel so in these calculations we assume uh, ionization equilibrium so based on these evidences so how do we cook these hot loops in the active region course so there are it's a three step process in the first step we need to have some energy release mechanism in our observations it is clearly through some flux cancellation and magnetic reconnection at some lower heights 
So once we release this energy at any, at any location along this axis of the loop, the energy is quickly transported to the other end through either thermal conduction or particle acceleration and gets deposited on the other end. And then it starts to heat the, local, the plasma locally there and evaporates the plasma. As this process goes, we have a complete loop that is hot and shows up at 10 million Kelvin or so. So this is a three-step process to uh, heat the plasma to very high temperatures. With this, I would like to summarize my talk. So we find that mixed polarity magnetic field is a common phenomenon at the base of coronal loops, which is different and important to be considered because all the coronal loop models of 3D or 1D assume that the coronal loops map from a single polarity on one side to a single polarity on the other side. But with this presence of mixed polarities, you can have a very, very dynamic magnetic topology at a low height that creates a lot of jets and bursts at the foot points of these coronal loops. And in the observations we presented, magnetic reconnection in the lower atmosphere seem to really power these hot coronal loops. So we need to understand what would be the role of Parker's braiding in heating these coronal loops at the end. And in our 1D model simulations, 1D loop models, we show that thermal conduction is at least sufficient or efficient to transport the generated heat on one side to the other side within the cadence of AIA which is about 12 seconds. So thank you. So there is no criteria as such. For the one you used it. Yes. So at least it should show very strong Doppler shifts and it should show some bidirectional jets mm -hmm. and the counts in the silicon four has to be about certain threshold. And uh, all these were satisfied. And we were more interested in to understand the magnetic topology that created this compact burst like feature. So Compared to the other UV bursts that are reported in the literature, this is clearly a UV burst in terms of the energy release or the Doppler shifts or the lines that it is visible in. For example, we don't see oxygen-4 line, which is uh, the case when we have uh, high densities or because of the, the oxygen line gets diminished due to the collisional de excitation. We see very strong silicon lines uh, both uh, the shorter wavelength and the longer wavelength. That means 1394 and 1403. And then we do see uh, significant enhancements in the chromosphere, in the magnesium lines. But um, that's about it. Our main goal was to understand the magnetic topology and what triggered this uh, UV burst in the, and what was also the magnetic re uh, height of magnetic reconnection. Yes. Okay, so in, did you see it in like the nickel two? Yes. You know, three? Yes. Because um, you showed the, the no pole in about 500 kilometers. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any spectral diagnostics where yes. you could get an upper or lower bound um, observationally. Yes. So we do, see, we do see nickel uh, two lines, absorb, absorption lines on the silicon 1394, the blue wing of 1394. So this already indicates that that particular event must have happened at uh, at least in the lower chromosphere or upper photosphere somewhere about that height. Okay, and you had no oxygen for at all? It's very, very weak okay. and noisy, and I don't think I can do any diagnostics of density from that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, kind of uh, insulting that every time this happens, the one density diagnostic always just disappears. Yeah. Yes. And they are not exactly the distance of our zone. And they are at the, at the, some of what you showed was at the periphery of, of the 
So at least um, for the UV burst where uh, the magnetic field is to be uh, uh, is observed at the periphery, we also looked into uh, the horizontal magnetic field maps and then at least we got the indication that this particular parasitic polarity which is really small is really there and it is the additional evidence comes already from the burst itself as the parasitic magnetic polarity ma uh, polarity which is so it is a positive element embedded between two negative polarities so as it moves from the north to south you can see that the burst is following that uh, parasitic element so if it is a magnetic reconnaissance signature that particular opposite polarity field should they should be there otherwise it's very difficult to create a reconnection event of that intensity that shows bidirectional jets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can uh, show you one plot quickly and then uh, we can discuss that. I did not have that plot uh, in the presentation, but then Just a minute. Yeah, so here is a full evolution of the ghost curve for that event and also the other events that we observed in that particular active region. So um, maybe I will go back first. So this is the ah come on. So this is the ghost curve that I showed earlier, and maybe I can now describe this. So on that given day, there are about six brightenings that we could observe in the active region. All of these are loop brightenings clearly associated with some flux cancellation in the photosphere and leading to the heating in the corona. And each of these brightenings can be associated almost uniquely to a bump that is observed in the ghost light curve. And we were also lucky that there is only one active region that day on the entire disk and only that active region is showing some micro flaring activity. So all the ghost light curve here, though it's normalized, it's about the between A and B class flares. So some people will consider this as micro flares and some people may not consider this as micro flaring activity, but then we, we say, okay, it's a micro flaring activity and each of these micro flaring activity can be associated with a singular brightening that is observed in the AIA 94 Angstrom's channel. And the event that I presented in the, in the plot is this, the first one. It's actually a three-part peak in the ghost. So there are three events that happen during a matter of five minutes in the field of view. And the event that we described is the middle one in the three-part ghost, uh, three-part peak in the ghost. We can time it very accurately because we have a, a very high temporal cadence from ghost of three seconds. And we have very good cadence of 12 seconds from uh, uh, AIA. So, that is also something that we, would, we find that the coronal loops that we see in the active regions are all flares, all micro flares. If you, if you can distinguish a coronal loop in an active region, that is probably a flaring coronal loop. Otherwise, everything in the background 
because of the dynamic range of the imaging or whatever you cannot distinguish these individual peaks maybe but then if something is clearly peaking like this in the ghost you can associate with a singular event in the active region provided you have only one active region on the disk Yes. And um, if you look in Kino Day observations, and I back when, especially when the uh, uh, imaging magnetograph still works, right? There's going to be high resolution, reasonably good quality magnetic field observations, mm -hmm. and XRT is much better at observing hot plasma yes. than AIA. Yes. Yes. And so I think that you know, if you want to sort of track down whether these are Systematically related to, or what's what set of um, cancellations mm -hmm. results in transient loop brightening, right? Because there are lots of cancellations that don't result in transient loop brightening. Yes, that's that true. Might be, there's, there's a lot of active region observations mm -hmm. from early Kino day, so that might be a, a fruitful. Yes. Fruitful so point. at least for this active region, so this particular loop brightening, and then the loop brightening coming from the this uh, mm -hmm. image here are in the same active region yep. and both these loop brightenings were observed by uh, the beryllium thin or medium filter of XRT mm -hmm. and we can clearly see these loops getting yep. brightened and my point is that if you have an associ if you have some clearly distinguishable loop that brightens there is clearly a energy release event because of some small scale flux cancellation event in the photosphere. Right. Yes. Right. But some of yeah. But the conditions in which those occur, if you, I mean, because you pointed out when you were looking at the when you're showing the um, sunrise observations yeah. that having higher resolution magnetograms is really helpful. Yes. Right higher than HMI. Yes, yes. And and Hinode has those. Yes. But the problem with Hinode is that it only has uh, a spectropolarimeter which has fairly lower cadence compared to oh, yeah. the no, other magnetograms. Yes, uh, I looked into that, but NFI has, there are only very few uh, data sets that are suitable for this kind of study, and the field of view is really small. Yeah, so I tried doing that, but, uh, mm -hmm. and I also wanted to do with this, this with uh, HMI because HMI is accessible and to everybody and then everybody can basically check the results so whether these loops are created through flux cancellation or do we need some braiding um, I thought it's better to do with the HMI because it's more accessible to everybody and uh, processing is much straightforward but at least uh, you can already see at the HMI scales some very tiny magnetic elements can be detected of course the the signal that is there and the level of magnetic field could be much different if you observe the same thing with the high resolution element, yes. But already those seem to trigger these uh, loop brightenings, yes. Yes. I think they seem to get nice uh, coronal loops, but I think they have just, uh, uh, they don't have mixed polarities uh, in their under football and so loops. Yes. No. Uh, the photospheric braiding in the B frost simulation or also uh, Matea simulation, he, he also gets self consistently loops that are uh, really beautiful and hot for a very, uh, wise, uh, I'm very, uh, obsessed with the loops because I find them to be extremely uh, aesthetic uh, but he gets uh, very self-consistent loops in his simulations and uh, at least um, the photospheric braiding already has sufficient energy flux per se to provide the necessary heating into the corona but this is only a stable energy flux all the time because we have the braiding going on all the time and the granular motions are more or less the same 
so several people argue for example uh, jim klimchuk or spiro uh, they argue that you needs to have some sort of switch on mechanism that you slowly twist the magnetic field store sufficient energy and switch on this so called dissipative process that eventually leads to hot coronal loops but that's what i try to do from the observations but every time i see a loop brightening i can identify the loop brightening and the energy release source to a flux cancellation source in the photosphere and where the energy released is a different question because we don't have such a nice height coverage uh, from the photosphere to corona uh, in the chromosphere we do not have many good high spatial resolution observations so the energy release could be anywhere from photosphere to transition region that i am not uh, commenting on but then these loop brightenings are more likely created due to flux cancellation but there are these plumes in the sunspots that are directly in the umbra of the sunspot there of course there is no mixed polarity but most of the plumes are mostly cooling so there is no real heating happening there so the heating is happening elsewhere and what we see is a draining of the plasma yeah thanks again oh thanks